Good evening and welcome to Big Tent Live Events, our live online event series from the University of Oxford as part of the Humanities Cultural Programme, one of the founding stones for the future Stephen A. Schwartzman Centre for the Humanities. My name is Wes Williams. I'm the director of TORCH, the Oxford Centre for the Humanities. I'm Professor of French and also a fellow in French at St Edmund Hall. I'm also an occasional maker of theatre who spent a year studying theatre and the work of the Schaubühne in what was then West Berlin back in the day. So I'm especially excited about this evening's conversation. This is our final Big Tent event for this term, and we would like to thank our viewers for their continued support, as well as all of our speakers for giving their time, their words and their ideas as we come together online. This series would also not be possible without the support from so many people behind the scenes, including the Torch team. Thank you all so much. If you would like to put forward any questions to our two speakers during the event tonight, please put them in the comments box in YouTube below. We encourage you to submit these early as possible. They're then fed through to me, and then we have time to advance as many as possible in the Q&A at the end of the discussion. Now, on to our excellent speakers tonight. It's an honor to host and welcome two internationally renowned theater directors for this evening's discussion. Firstly, we welcome back for her second time in the big tent, our visiting fellow, Katie Mitchell. And joining Katie tonight from Berlin's Schaubühne is Thomas Ostermeyer. Katie, welcome. Katie's work is well known to audiences across the globe. In a career spanning 30 years, she has directed over 100 productions, including text-based theatre, opera, installations, and multimedia work. From her early days as an assistant director with Payne's Plough and at the RSC, to her recent success with La Maladie de la Mort, created at the Théâtre des Bouffes du Nord, and Orlando at Berlin Schaubühne, which a number of you, I imagine, have seen this last week. Mitchell has become renowned for bold and innovative productions. Working with classic texts as well as with contemporary writers, she has collaborated with the Royal Opera House, the National Theatre, the RSC, and the Royal Court, as well as theatres across Europe, to produce work which provokes and inspires in equal measure. Her many awards include the, include the Evening Standard Best Director Award, the British Academy's President's Medal, and in 2009, she was presented with the Order of the British Empire for her services to theatre. Now this happens every now and then, the light has just gone off in this place, so I'm gonna to have to go and turn the lights on. While I do that, perhaps you can bring Thomas Ostermeyer on screen. Thank you. Thomas, are you there? Yes, I'm back. Okay. <laughs> um, it's one of these lights that turns off automatically if you don't move. So, Thomas Ostermeyer has been resident director and member of the artistic direction of the Schaubühne Theatre in Berlin since 1999. From 96 to 99, he was the artistic director of the Baraka at the Deutsches Theater in Berlin. He's directed more than 50 plays and teaches directing at the Ernst Busch Academy of Dramatic Arts. His productions tour worldwide. He's directed at Vienna's Burgtheater and Munich's Kammerspiel at the Hamburg Schauspielhaus in the Théâtre Vidi Lausanne and the Comédie Française in Paris. In fact, in November 2004, he became an associate artist for the Festival d'Avignon. In 2009, the French Ministry of Culture appointed him an officer of the Order of Arts and Letters, and he was promoted to a commander in 2015. From 2010 to 18, Ostermeyer was the German president of the German-French Council of Culture. For his contributions to European theatre, he was awarded an honorary Doctor of Arts degree from the University of Kent in 2016 and 2019 from the University of Gothenburg. Amongst many other awards, Thomas Ostermeyer received the Golden Lion of the Venice Biennale for the entirety of his work in 2011. In other words, we have two titans of European theatre to discuss things with us today, and it's very exciting. Welcome to you both, and thank you again for joining us this evening. Thank you. Um, I thought, I mean, thank you especially, Thomas, since you're right at, at the edge of a new show, um, as you told us just as you arrived. I thought I might kick the conversation off, if I may, by just asking how the two of you got to know either each other or about each other's work. Um, Katie, do you want to start? Well, obviously, you know, Thomas was just such an important artist when I was starting out and a young person and everyone talked about him. So, oh, my God, the most interesting work is going on in Berlin that Ostermeyer does. Um, but I don't think we we met. When did we meet, actually, Thomas? I can't remember. Do you? A long a, time ago. We met at a conference of the European Theatre Convention for the first time, which, mm -hmm. which happened, I think, in Stockholm, wasn't yeah. it? I think that's right. 
Yes, because it, we, it was a big meeting, wasn't it? Karen Bayer was there, Calixto Bieto, Laurent Pali, and we were all very, very young, and you couldn't stay for long. That I don't remember, but I remember that I was very impressed by you and by, by what you were saying. And I thought, oh, wow, an, an intelligent person around. Oh, well, very good. I was just overwhelmed by your articulacy. But, yeah. but then, then we were off each other's radar for some time, weren't we? That's right. And then, and then I saw a, a request concert, uh, which you did in Cologne. And uh, I was uh, I was a bit shocked because I, I liked the show a lot, but I was shocked by the fact that I did not follow your artistic work after having met you years before and asked you uh, to show me or to come and work for the Schaubühne. So I, I, I felt a bit miserable because I thought of you, I, I was just too late. But anyway, after having seen this one, I, I invited you. And since we have an ongoing collaboration. Yeah, which is fantastic, because for me, it was just so exciting to be invited. I thought I never would be invited to the Shabuna. But but what's so exciting is that we've done six shows now I've done for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, of course, I, I should say that you're a rather amazing boss. And, okay. and why is that? Is that I think you allow total freedom to the artists who you invite in and although you do offer notes you always make your notes optional yeah yeah <laughs> but, but one of the best moments i remember do you remember in the first show that i did you know, i came to and did miss julie with uh, a live cinema show with with live video cameras and um i remember you coming into the auditorium and sitting there and looking and you looked very grumpy so I, I went up to you and said, what is wrong, Thomas? And you said, I cannot cope with all these period costumes. I'm feeling physically sick. You said, in all the years that I've been here, we have never had a period costume. True. And you said you would, the only reason you were letting them into the theatre was because there was video cameras. Otherwise, it would be over between us. Do you remember that moment? <laughs> I didn't say it would be over between us. That I didn't say. I said, I said, this is the only way for me to have period costumes on stage when you have like a contemporary frame, which you provide with your fantastic video or film work that you're doing. So I, I was in, in, I wasn't grumpy because I, because of the period costumes. I was more grumpy because because of the idea, because of the simple fact that it's possible to have period costumes all of a sudden, if you give it a contemporary framing. So in the end, I was just a bit jealous and not grumpy because all of a sudden there are period costumes. So you, can I intervene? Are you now thinking a bit like you were thinking the lost opportunity of working with Katie earlier? Were you now thinking, ah, I could have had all those shows in period costume if only there'd been some video involved? Way, yes, yes, in a way, yes. But that was also linked to, to this special period of my work because now I'm not so much concerned anymore with uh, classical uh, plays um, and how to put them on stage. I, I'm, I'm in a new and different uh, period now. So with, in, in that phase, when because you were doing a lot of Ibsen, obviously Shakespeare, iconic productions of Shakespeare, Hamlet and your, your Richard, you know, really iconic. What, just for the British audience listening in, what is the, the feeling about period costumes? Why is there the problem with it? Because of course we're in a culture where we do a lot of period costumes on our stages, you know? What's, what's your problem with it? Mm, I think my problem is that immediately when I see period costumes on stage, it's not that I watch something which is about this time, but it's old fashioned theater. So I, ca I cannot, I cannot um, do an ab abstraction of, uh, uh, yeah, but this is a form, this is an aesthetic form. For me, it's always dusty and old fashioned and and boring and and uh, and so on and so on. So um, that's why I have this issue with period costumes. Mm. 
And you, the aesthetic, for when you were starting out with La Baraka, the, the, the aesthetic was very particular, wasn't it? When you were starting out at the Deutsches Theater. And, yeah. and it was very, very sort of modern and violent and uh, contemporary in a way that sort of- The face drama, they called it. Yeah. And, and where did that come from? Where did that work come from in you? Actually, I was very much inspired at that time by photographers like Nick Warplington and Nan Golden. They mm -hmm. were my heroes. And so I tried to work with this aesthetics in the theater. Mm. And then when it came to doing classics, like the period that you talk about that you're through now. <laughs> <laughs> did, did you leave people like Golding behind? No, not, not really. Like my first show, which um, kind of was a, a turning point in my, my work was uh, A Doll's House, my first adaptation of a Gibson play. And what happened was that I took uh, all the liberty to um, to put it in a in a in a contemporary setting and to even change parts of the text in order uh, to make it for me a play of today. Now I'm even further down the road. Um, I'm. Um, at the moment, I'm preparing a version of um, Oedipus Rex. Uh, how do you call it in English? Oedipus Rex. Yeah, good. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yes. and Ma Maya Sade, who is a dramaturg with us for over 20 years now and became a writer in the last five years, she wrote a version of, of Oedipus Rex. And, and it's completely new right it's a, it's, a, it's a whole new uh, play but of course dealing with the issues of of the classical uh, play but at, that's for me at the moment the way uh, to do these, uh, these these plays can i ask katie sorry can i ask about to go back to your sort of in your face moment again for british um audiences for this conversation I mean, that's a moment where you were also working with the texts of British writers, Mark Ravenhill, Sarah Kane, and so on. What was it that you thought British writers had that maybe contemporary German writers for the stage didn't offer you at that stage? Or was, was that not the, the motivation there? Well, British theatre was always a writer's theatre. And uh, while German theater, if you want to generalize things, uh, German theater was a director's theater. So it wasn't that important in, in Germany. You, you could have the, the impression that it's not so important what kind of play you do, but it's more important who does it. Mm -hmm. Who's the director? Not so much what's the play. And this led to a certain, um, I, I, I would even say decadence in German theater, that all of a sudden content got lost. Mm -hmm. It wasn't important anymore what, are, what we are talking about. It was important how we do it, the aesthetics. And this led to a situation where uh, new productions were circling around productions which have been there before. So they were responding to a show two years ago or to a show 10 years ago. So it was a complete uh, circle communication. It wasn't communicating with, with the outside, with the real world or the, the, with the auditorium. It was communicating amongst themselves. And, and that was the situation when I started off my career as a director. And um, I'm coming from a very modest background uh, where I grew up and uh, not at all from an academic family. So I wanted to reflect on my experiences in life. I wanted to reflect on what it is like to survive uh, under the new laws of neoliberalism. I wanted to reflect how tough 
uh, life uh, became in the big cities in the world uh, for young people in order to survive. And then there were these plays and one of this play was perfect, which was Mark Raven's Hill's uh, Shopping and Fucking, mm -hmm. describing the situation in, in, in post Thatcher, uh, uh, Great Britain, and the struggle for survival of, 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 a, of a younger generation. And it was exactly the same situation in Germany. So all of a sudden, uh, we could reflect real life. We could talk or tell a story which is happening outside. And for German audiences, it was a kind of, wow, how is this possible? Mm -hmm. How is this possible that you go to the theater and all of a sudden you don't see period costumes and you don't listen to text, which honestly, when you listened at that time to a Shakespeare production, you did not understand what it is about because they were using these old translations of Shakespeare, which are so hard to follow and to understand that this was part of the experience going to a theater was you don't understand what they are saying on stage. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm exaggerating here, but it was true for like 80% of what I saw. And I hated what I saw. I really hated theater. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I still do actually. Mm -hmm. So I, 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 yeah, I do. No, me too. I'm yeah. not a great fan of it. I don't go and see it by choice, really. I'd much rather go and see a film. I have to, because I have to look for new directors. But um, I, um, I, 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 I'm really struggling. And sometimes I really do feel, oh, it's, it's so embarrassing that you're part of this milieu, of this scene of people. I would dream to be part of a music uh, uh, milieu or, or fine arts. It's much more interesting people. And yeah, it's, it feels sometimes, it feels like it, it's, it's, it's an out dying art form. Mm. But yes. there must have been something that you saw in Katie's theater that you didn't hate. Um, so there was something in Katie's theater that you thought, okay, I don't hate this. I actually like something here, and that's why I want to invite her. What was it? Yeah, of course. What is it still? I mean, um, especially, but not only, but especially her work with cameras on stage and this multi-layered form of storytelling, mm -hmm. and this, uh, which is at the time fascinating because I, I, I would never be able to do this myself. I mean, it's, it's like mathematics, what's happening in the rehearsal room when, when Katie is uh, doing a show. It's, I, I, my brain would, would, would have uh, uh, clouds of smoke, you know, because it's... <laughs> <laughs> Your ears, yeah. I can't do this. Uh, this is one fascination, but the other is also of course, it's not only a technical thing. It's not only aesthetic. It is also that it's representing the fact that all is mise-en-scene. All is uh, um, uh, put on, on stage because you can see that it's put in front of the camera. So it's a kind of what we would call in German Verfremdungseffekt, uh, mm -hmm. this Brechtian term. Mm -hmm. Uh, alienation effect, I think you would translate yep. it. Yep. So um, it is it is a very smart thing to do. And, and uh, all of a sudden, it's possible to use period costumes to have these uh, texts and also uh, a way of acting, which I adore uh, and which uh, Katie is also a big fan of. I mean, Katie has this passion for um, method of acting, how she, she even did uh, one year of research on this. And there are not a lot of directors I know which have such a big passion for actors and a, such a big interest of uh, the art of acting or the method of uh, how, to, how to make uh, believe what an actor in front of you is doing. Uh, how do you train this? So. Um, and, and I think we shared this, and uh, that then that's another reason for why I, I uh, I'm so happy when 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 Katie comes because it is 
at the time aesthetically very advanced uh, and at the same time it is good acting so it's not only a media show a media in installation it's also very fine acting and last but not least uh, the content uh, katie is talking about you know and I mean, a lot of uh, what she did for us Miss Julie, the yellow wallpaper, Orlando, <clears throat> just to name a few, is a, um, a female view on, on a male dominated world. And uh, that's a very important uh, color of our program. Thank you. Okay, about training, I was always really interested in your training, but I never got an opportunity to really sit and talk to you about it because it's always so stressful. Or the steam is actually coming out of my ears as well, making that that work. And am I right to, you know, I, I recall a conversation where you mentioned the word Meyerhold. Mm. And also you mentioned a very specific professor mm -hmm. who had influenced you. And, and, and obviously Meyerhold came out of Stanislavski's stable Mm -hmm. um, but developed in a completely different way. Is it possible to talk about the influence of that way of thinking about acting and indeed the teacher who introduced you to that way of thinking about acting? Yeah, the teacher was Gennadim Bogdanov and he was trained in Moscow in the 70s by an actor who was trained by Meyerhold. So kind of close to the original handwriting of Meyerhold. And wow, well, I mean, this is a big issue. I could give you now a talk of one hour, but I try to put it all in a nutshell. Um, in the end, what Meyerhold tried to do is um, further develop a naturalistic theater, which he learned with Meyerhold, uh, with Stanislavski, but then he was fed up of it. Also, Stanislavski himself, at a certain point of his career, was completely desperate. Actually, it was the moment when he was performing himself, Dr. Stockmann, in, in, in The Enemy of the People. That was his last character on stage, and then he stopped acting, uh, Stanislavski. Why did it happen? Because he came to a dead end in his um, realistic psychological way of making theater. Um, he, he had a mental breakdown and, and a lot of his actors did have. So they were training too, too much into the direction of psychological uh, challenges. And, what, and when Meyerhold comes in, he tries to invent a form where you tell about the inner life of a character with how the chain of actions is structured. Mm -hmm. So a, a chain of actions on stage do tell you about the inner state of the character. To give a very simple example, uh, you could, you could with this, this very famous scene of Stanislavski, you come into a room and then there is a letter and you open the letter, a very famous Etude by Stanislavski, you open the letter and then there's written your, 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 your mother died and now act this out. So the, 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 the Stanislavskian way would be, okay, I try to um, make creative my inner uh, memory of moments where I felt shocked. While, uh, but this is very generalized and very simple, but just to give you an idea, while Meyerhold would talk to you, okay, how could we, by what's happening with your body, tell about your inner state? And, and that would mean just drop the glass which you have in your hand and the glass falls to the floor and, uh, uh, and this will have a big effect on the audience and tell them what that there is a shocking news in this letter. But didn't didn't Stanislavski didn't he introduce that possibility when he moved from emotional memory to physical actions? Yes, I mean, but that, yes, 
that was Stanislavski himself. He introduced this later. Yeah. But before Stanislavski introduced this, Meyerhold already was working on this. Ah. Meyerhold was just two steps earlier in this in this uh, uh, investigation. I just think it's so interesting, isn't it? Because I'm really interested in late Stanislavski. So I, I like physical actions. I don't really like the emotional memory, which went to the US and became the system of method. So I just think it's an amazing um, harmony actually between our different approaches, which is why we probably really like the acting in each other's productions. Yeah, I we're looking at how the inner life is embodied in the physical actions of the. I, of I, I, I completely agree with you, and of course, I'm I myself I'm tending more to the late Stanislavski, but also um, I'm I'm again going through a kind of uh, change in my view on on method of acting, and I think only. Uh, physical action is also not the 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 the, the key. So it sh it should also be a work on the inner life uh, of of a performer, and the performer he or she himself herself should also be aware of what uh, might be called personality education. So developing your own personality, developing a kind of um, um, awareness, developing sensitivity, and so on and so on. So, um, but I'm 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 now stepping on ground, which is I had a long conversation yesterday with a very famous sociologue who was working at the Schaubühne Heinz Bude, and and uh, the question it was my question was how big is the part of a situation when 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 a, a human being comes into a situation is 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 the situation dominating the action or is it the, the situation and the personality and if it's the if it's if the personality is part of how a situation develops how could we have uh, categories of personalities and and the sociologue said, well, the categories of personalities uh, which are provided by psychology are too banal. And sociologues mm -hmm. always say, no, no, there's more individual typen, <coughs> individualities. Uh, and, and even what they are, uh, how they are breaking it down in modern psychology, it's only like, I, I think it's five, five basic uh, types of, of, of personalities. So after doing a lot of research on situation and physical chain of actions, I'm more going towards now, okay, what is personality? How much types of personality do we have? How does personality express? And how can I work with an actor on the character? Because for the years being, the 20 years behind me, the 25 years behind me, I, I refused to talk with actors about characters. I always said... I remember that. I remember you finding it really weird when I did character biographies. Yeah. And you just really rejecting that. It was, it was very absolute, your position. Yeah. And I felt a bit nervous. I, I think I have actually hid some of my character biography work from you. Mm -hmm. you no, know, because I will always do a biography. I mean, I think not in the way that you're thinking about developing it. Mine's just a sort of more mechanical, chronological order of events that have shaped the present behavior. And maybe what you're looking at is something much more nuanced and complex. Yeah, but in the end, a biography is also, when you do work on the biography of a character, you could also say, okay, what are the situations the character went through till the moment that he goes or she goes on stage. Mm -hmm. Okay. It can also be a, a, a sum of situations in the life which he or she passed. Mm -hmm. And then it's again situation. But my question would be if a, a personality like this goes through the same events like a personality like this, but they come out with different mm -hmm. results of the same experiences. 
And why is that? And how can we have an idea of what is determining how this character and this character act under the same given circumstances? So you are getting into the past of the character, Thomas. I am a bit shocked, I have to say. I'm <laughs> just like, right. But, but I'm also just, is it possible to talk a little bit about where you are with your work now? Because in a way, are you saying that with the early work, like with Ibsen and then into Shakespeare, you were taking the textual material really seriously, but sort of twisting it and reshaping it. And now you're actually letting go of having to deal with that very tricky problem of having to twist the square peg of the language into the round hole of the concept. And now you just go, oh, I'll just put the language in the bin, but I'm going to do the story. I have to admit, and I have to admit that this is also um, thanks to uh, a, a contemporary director who is actually working at my theater at the moment, who takes this liberty already for some years. And I said, okay, fuck, why am I not doing it? Mm -hmm. and, and he admitted that he got so inspired with having my, seen my work in Australia when we traveled, had a Gabla and, and, and Nora and Enemy of the People. And we brought all this to Australia when he was a, a young actor and he saw these shows. And this was his inspiration to go further. And now he inspired me to go further. But don't you love that interconnectedness? You know, I remember I had the same, the same sort of feeling when I went to see Ivo van Ho's show for the first time in Amsterdam. And I, so I realized he's using radio mics. And I thought, why, why didn't I think of that? What am I doing putting all my energy into getting the amplification of the voice so that it distorts the precise psychology of the acting? Mm -hmm. And I thought, what an idiot. <clears throat> Don't you love those connections where, where someone um, gives you a sort of a, such an obvious thing yes. that you just forgot to think about it. I completely agree, but Katie, usually we don't talk about it. Why not? Because well, we... I think I think what happens is that we're often put in a situation where we maybe are not talking to each other. Yeah. And so we're <clears throat> often being asked questions by people who are in our sector but may not be makers. So no, I'm very struck by that because I've done a little bit of my homework for this conversation and I've looked at some of the conversations you, Thomas, have had with other people that are up on the Shabina website. Mm. And I'm struck by the number of times, you know, so with Elizabeth LeConte and with various other people, you're saying exactly what Katie said earlier, which is actually we've never had this conversation um, uh, or never had time for this conversation because of, and I suppose that's a way of thinking about COVID. And what is what this this time that we're in now? I was just about even us. I was just about to say that's the only positive thing about COVID. We can reflect on our work, and we can share uh, these reflections with other artists in talks like we're doing now. I mean, if if uh, there wasn't uh, the pandemic, we would not have this conversation probably. No, we wouldn't have the time for it but because of our schedules, but also our interactions would be all around my absolute terror of whether I had made the show that you thought was high quality or poor quality. So it's very hard to have a relaxed chat whilst you're working for someone, isn't it, really? Yeah, yeah, sure. I think, I think it's, very, it's very tricky. But is it, is it possible maybe to talk a little bit about what the experience is now of being liberated from the linguistic problems and and yet doing a classic well the, the 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 first of all the liberty the freedom comes from the fact that i don't need to worry anymore about uh, the theater there were times where i was really worried you know about Schaubühne, economically audience and so on now is a time where sounds like a joke, but sometimes I even, uh, I'm very serious. I try to encourage the, the, the directors coming to do uh, a failure, <laughs> to make a flop, you know, to, 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 to work so cutting edge and so uh, um, experimental 
so that maybe they go too far and and because we i mean you know uh, katie we do have too many successful shows we have a repertoire <laughs> of i don't know 30 shows which we could show immediately and they all would have an audience we are still running uh, miss julie every now and then or we were before the pandemic and we, we can, we, I, can I don't know, we can run it for the next 10 years. <laughs> Orlando is the same. And some of the shows we don't show anymore of yours, uh, we don't show because the actors are not in the ensemble anymore, but we could have gone, uh, go on showing these beautiful uh, um, shows. So um, this is, this is the, 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 the basis for, for, for my freedom at the moment. So that all of a sudden I'm doing shows like Returning to Reims, uh, where I took a, a book, uh, a f philosophical, political, sociological uh, confession, which is not at all dramatic, which is not uh, even not a, a, a prose, but it's, it's, it's a scientific mm -hmm. biography. And, uh, and, and I take uh, the liberty to go and, and do a documentary and then put uh, um, on stage a, a studio where you do the voiceover for a documentary and, and two thirds of the show is a documentary movie. So, I'm, which of course, usually you would go saying you cannot do this because it's, it's not a theater show anymore. It's like, yeah. So are you saying that it's COVID that has sort of forced formal changes or experimentation? No, no, no. no, no. This was long before this, what I'm just talking about. Uh, returning to Reims was, uh, I don't know, four years ago or something. So, um, and then L'Histoire de la Violence, uh, like another prose, and Virginie de Pont, uh, Vernon Subutex, which I just stopped rehearsing, which should have had premiere in May and then in November, but still hasn't had its premiere. A lot of pros I'm doing and I'm, I'm much more enjoying myself because for, for Vernon Subutex, for example, I said, okay, I need a punk band. And we formed a, a, a beautiful group of music, musicians on stage. And um, I'm, I'm I'm much more talking uh, about myself and I'm using much more um, instruments of my past. So my, my, my time as a musician, uh, because I'm, I'm, I'm still regretting that I didn't have a career as a musician. Okay, so I put a band on stage instead and it's like a, like a rock post-punk concert uh, half of the evening and I don't care if anybody comes and says this is just music where where is the story where's the text I don't care you know so I have much more freedom uh, because we don't have this uh, pressure anymore this 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 pressure of uh, creating a success bringing an audience and of course we know it all if you have this freedom and you're more closely to your own need mm. what you want to tell the show is more beautiful and again <laughs> you create more audience because the audience feels if you talk about something where you really have a need to talk about or if you try to put up a show which brings audiences can i put to you one of the questions that has come from the audience which is how well, do you I just want to add some, one Sorry. thing I didn't know that, I, that it's so much about me. It should be more about K Katie. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm putting this to both of you. Um, how do the two of you balance what you've admitted as a kind of hatred of theatre with caring enough and trying to change what theatre is? I mean, in a way, you've started to answer that question, Thomas, in, in the last little, in response to Katie's previous question. But Katie, what keeps you invested in making theatre then? as opposed to, I don't know, rock concerts, films, other stuff? Why do you keep coming back to the particular practice of putting stuff on a stage? I think it's because I know what to do. I've trained in it, so I'm quite skilled in it. And uh, so it's, it's a sort of professional thing. It's like if I trained to make tables very beautifully, 
I would probably keep making tables because I need to earn a living. So there's a sort of pragmatic and skill um, aspect. I'm, I'm also really keen to constantly push the boundaries of the form. And I feel that the practice of theatre making is struggling to keep in step with all the intellectual changes that are going on at the moment. I'm going to turn the light on again, but do carry on. <laughs> yeah. so, so I'm really interested in seeing whether the art form can respond to the enormous uh, political and social changes that are going on at the moment or not. Mm -hmm. it, it's an art form that tends to, it can settle back into a very sort of easy, almost escapist place. Mm -hmm. Um, so how does one keep it really plugged into the issues that really matter, like the environment? So that's that's the thing that I'm really putting most of my energy into at the moment, mm -hmm. is how do you make pieces of theatre about the environmental catastrophe? Because, of course, we talk about COVID, but COVID is just a symptom of the environmental crises and population growth. So I'm I'm just very interested in how this old art form and address really modern ideas and what new formal experiments will be produced by it. So I'm with Thomas on that. I think it's a time for, for real radical um, investigation. What, what can the art form hold mm -hmm. of the enormous changes that are going on at the moment? I mean, can the art form have a conversation with the fact that nearly every person in the world has been forced into an existential crisis? by COVID, what state are people in now? What, what does the art form need to do to have a conversation with their new needs? Um, and what do we do about the other big sort of, you know, catastrophe that is, is, is happening around us, which is the environment. So I love the art form, um, I really do, but, but I think it needs to keep pushing forwards at the moment, otherwise I think it will be become an old model very very quickly I think there's a danger of it of it really falling behind the very important subjects and questions that are being thrown up by Covid the rise of the right I mean many things that are going on yep. at the moment it's such rapid intellectual political metaphysical change at the moment going on and I think trying to get the art form to keep up with that is is really challenging but, but I, I am with Thomas. I think it's a time for taking really big risks. Yep. Um, we're doing a hybrid project, aren't we? Our next project with you is that, um, uh, so I'm working with a British writer, Chris Bush, and she's writing uh, 10 short digital films, basically, which go out. And then the characters in the films, eventually we meet them in live performance, don't we? which is a, a really interesting experiment. I'm not sure it's possible to do it. And that's about the environment. Yep. So, so yep. I think it's a, a very exciting time for the art form. Yep. I have a little plug for ourselves now. I'm very excited that we're involved in that project too. And that we can, so through Dortch from the Humanities Culture Programme, we can get the, you know, get involved with, with uh, the two of you. So that actually already answers one of the other questions, which is what's the next collaboration between the Charbonne and Katie and when's it happening? And the answer is now, or it's already underway uh, to some degree. I want to go back to the, sorry, I want to go back to the question of, of the now though, because another question from, from the audience is, when you come into contact with younger theatre makers through teaching or through, um, you were talking about the, the guy from Australia that, who was a younger, what mood are you finding amongst them about the future of theatre? Does it match yours or are they somewhere different to you? Let's ask Thomas that one first. I, I'm, I'm always shocked uh, about uh, a lot of uh, the theater makers of the younger generation that they seem not to be interested in the life of human beings. Which I'm very much concerned, you know, my basic question uh, is what is our condition humaine. Why are we here? Why are we behaving like we do? Why are we jealous? Why are we vicious? What, what, what's, you know, this famous phrase of Büchner, was ist das, was in uns lügt, stiehlt, hurt und mordet? What is it inside of ourselves 
which makes us lie, uh, steal, um, and kill other people. Yep. Um, and when you say young, the young theatre makers aren't involved, does that go back to your earlier point about theatre being about theatre being about theatre? In a um, way, a, cl a closed system? Yeah. They are very much uh, interested in media, in uh, form, in aesthetics, in form of um, deconstru deconstruction, which is all beautiful. But I think the first thing uh, to work in literature, movies, uh, theater, any kind of narration um, should be the interest for the people around you. Oh, but Thomas, that isn't my experience of the younger generation that I've been teaching during COVID, which is basically all I've been doing is teaching for a year. It's been really interesting. I feel that, that that isn't the case. And that may be just a sort of a cultural thing. Maybe that's just a thing that happens in Germany that you're talking about. So my experience is a, a really a, a generation who are really battered a bit. They're battered because they are having to deal with the environmental catastrophe, which our generation failed to save them from. They're battered because they're struggling their way through educational systems where they're having to do everything uh, via Zoom. They're battered because of the complexity of conversations thrown up by Black Lives Matter and the ongoing conversation about Me Too. So I, I sort of really feel for the generation that I've been in contact with and, and I don't experience them in, in the way that you are. And, and my experience is more that I think that the, the more we can spend a bit of time with them, I think the better. Even if the time you could spend the time to go, listen, it's the human thing that matters. <laughs> and I can spend the time going, yes, the human thing really matters, but it's the form that really matters. You know, that's if that's I will be teaching concept all the time, Thomas, and you're trying to unteach it. And I just think that's that's maybe a reflection of the sort of different countries that we're we're working in. But but I do feel very protective of that generation. And uh, really, uh, the ex my experience of moving between teaching in sort of, I, I don't know, uh, Copenhagen, Oslo, New York, London, Luxembourg, has been a generation who are, are really struggling. <laughs> no, I'm, that's for sure that they are struggling. And I, I completely agree with how you describe this generation. Um, and uh, I, I have to correct myself a little bit. In, in my uh, teaching, they, they, they do feel very much interested in these questions, but then when they do their diploma work, I'm always surprised that what, what comes out in the end, you know? Mm. Yeah, but we know how hard it is. Uh, yeah. I mean, to direct is really, really, really hard. There's no, no two questions about it. To get it out in any shape, that is dynamic and interesting and bearable to watch is in, it's enormously challenging, don't you yeah, think? I, I agree 100%. It's a nightmare. Don't do it. <laughs> this is another question then, which is how do you balance the kind of production process? I hope I understand this question. It, it, I think the question is basically saying it is hard, so how do you do it? in terms of the kind of interaction with others in the team, actors, crew, lighting, camera people, is that, it, it sort of goes back to the thing of director's theater that you were talking about a while ago, Thomas. Is, is the director the sort of, the king, the president, the, the, the ruler who has to be in charge of all of that? Or is there a degree of collaboration in your work where you can let that go and there's a measure of freedom around those things? I guess they're asking, how much of a control freak are you guys? Well, the thing is, I, I, of course, it's a balance, isn't it? And, and I don't think there's any rules about it. I mean, I work horizontally, which means that I am genuinely interested in 
everyone's uh, feedback. So I will be as interested in what the dresser has to say as the leading actor in the camera person. And whenever we're doing run throughs at the end, we'll always sit down and listen to everyone's point of view. But I also know that I'm the final decision maker and that everyone accepts that. So there's a contradiction between a sort of very horizontal listening in to everyone, checking that everyone's really happy and everyone's feeling safe and clear, whilst at the same time being the final decision maker. So is that a contradiction or is it precisely because you're prepared to take on that role that everybody else has the freedom to do what they're doing? I, I don't know. What, what, what do you yeah. think, Thomas? I think um, this soft skills uh, are in my moment uh, of my work is the most important thing to be developed. Yeah. For me. Um, this is where I'm struggling most. And this is uh, what for some years already now I'm trying to work on. Um, because I, I don't need to work on my creativity or um, how to have an idea or how to bring this idea on stage. I really need to work and I'm, I'm, I'm doing this, I'm taking uh, coaching lessons on this, uh, on, on communication. Mm. I, I agree. I think the soft skills for directing are, are really, really challenging and they're, they're not something that uh, is taught up front. So if you think it's communication, guiding groups, leadership, decision making um it, it's it's very very subtle territory and it, and it's very important territory also in this time for for our generation i think don't you don't you feel and for me it's the most important field i know that this is completely underdeveloped and this is where i need to get uh, better mm. and there's unconscious biases that i feel i have that i really have to sort of unpick and address and deal with in in this time um you guys are both doing this, if I may say so, from positions of authority already. In other words, you've, you've got to a particular position and you're realizing, oh, I need to develop these skills now. Obviously, that's different for somebody who's just starting out um, and who might think, OK, soft skills are all very well, but it won't get me to where you guys are. Um, uh, in other words, do you think there's a, a kind of, uh, is there still a sort of, hardness since you used the word soft to begin with is there still a hardness you have to have to get to the point of running your own show running your own theater making your own work you know you must have had to push at various points no i don't, I don't think so I, okay. what i experienced is that like the really great artists and theater directors are very nice people it's not at all about this old fashioned idea of being hard and knowing all the time what to do and um, giving orders or something. I, I... No, I, I really agree. But I think maybe the lesson that we can offer to the younger generation is that in order to have a really fruitful career, you need to balance hard skills which are what Thomas was, was talking about, about the ability to create concepts and come up with very strong ideas with the soft skills. Yeah. And, and it, I suppose my trajectory, which is I, I think maybe like Thomas's, is we bumped into the need for the soft skills quite late on in our careers. Yeah. I now teach it. Six soft skills, 10 hard skills, mm -hmm. and, and, and give equal value to both mm -hmm. skill sets. I think they're equally important. Mm -hmm. for the evolution of a, of a career and the development of ideas on stage. My only, my only uh, soft skill, which is really developed since the beginning and which always saved my life is, is uh, that I'm funny. <laughs> fun. <laughs> yes, you have got a very good sense of humor, Thomas. <laughs> yeah, well, that's the only way to survive. Yeah, it's true. That's very important sometimes in a rehearsal room, you know. Yeah, that's, I think that's right. That saved me a lot of times that I can have self irony and that I don't take myself too serious. It's very important. Yeah, I think light touch is very important. 
I okay. don't always achieve it, you know, Thomas. But actually, one I, more. people Sorry. laugh a lot more than people imagine they do. Mm -hmm. I think no, we think they're all terribly serious, your rehearsal, Katie. Nobody ever laughs as in your. It's no, I was only true. talking to my students this morning about the fact that I, I can't get over the fact that I'm really perceived as being very stern and serious, but actually I'm not. I'm quite a cheerful, light-hearted person. Okay, we have that on record now. <laughs> um, <laughs> I've yes. got one more question, which, I, if I may, and that that's, um, it sort of runs through the conversation here, which is, the again, a balance question. What's the balance between um, writing and perhaps today commissioning a living writer to write a new piece and effectively adaptation, breaking, twisting, making something old live again. Um, Thomas, either of you got thoughts on that? Go Thomas. Uh, well, I'm not so much commissioning a place uh, at the moment because I'm so lucky to have Maya Sade, and she is in an incredibly uh, moment of creativity. So she, uh, every two months there's a new play and uh, every play is so beautiful that I want to do it and, and others want to put it on stage. So we, don't, we are not in this need. Um, then I have uh, this very um, important relationship with Edouard Louis. Uh, who did write uh, his first play and which I directed with him on stage in Paris in September. So I asked him to perform his own text, which he did and which was a beautiful experience. And I just had him on the phone this morning and he, he, he wrote a second part. Uh, first part is who killed my father, father and now he's writing on his mother. Um, another monologue and he asked me to, 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 to start working on it with him. So I have a lot of, a lot of um, 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 things to do with contemporary writers. Mm -hmm. Then the other thing is having done uh, Vernon Subotex by Virginie Dupont is uh, actually I, 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 watching this during the last days of rehearsal, I, I thought myself oh wow this is pretty something because or maybe because Virginie did take two three five years to write this and uh, it's a it's a universe uh, of, of very diverse characters in both sense of the word mm -hmm. and um, it's not uh, a, a, a play where you have the feeling, oh, this this play should have w was written fast because uh, it was commissioned and the, and the director was waiting for the result to put it on stage and we have contracts and so on and so on. No, there was like like this old school idea of a writer um, who sits at home and really writes about what he needs to talk about and takes the time. It's, it's very much like Balzac, you know, it's, it's really, it's a realistic novel of 600 pages. And, and sometimes this is very good to nourish um, theater, to, to bring back this incredible wide perspective of prose into, into theater. Mm -hmm. So this is my experience with 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 uh, adaptations of of novels and and new writing, and then this this classic. I mean, my my interest for Shakespeare and my will to do it. I'm I'm sure that I will, when I'm one day going to die, that I did not have the opportunity to have made all the Shakespeare plays which I want to do. And this is very depressing and very sad. And I need, re I really need to hurry to do at least four or five uh, more. And that, that's definitely what I want to do. Um, and uh, I, I know already what and when and who um, in the next five, six years, there will be two or three more uh, Shakespeare 
um, productions and uh, also one or two uh, versions uh, of, of, of Ibsen. I'm thinking you need to read, there's a great sonnet by Keats, when I have fears that I may cease to be, where he's worried about how he might not get all the things in his head out uh, before he dies, including a version of King Lear. Um, but anyway, Katie, you're putting, you're putting your nose up at all this Shakespeare stuff, um, because that's, that's, that's not your bag, it's not you. But could you say something about this balance um, that Thomas had just explained really brilliantly between, on the one level, on the one hand, kind of, uh, already written texts of various kinds, and then new writing um, uh, and your engagement with new writing? Um, I think I'm interested in ideas and relationships more than whether it's new writing or adaptation. So uh, at the moment, I'm just very preoccupied with um, uh, feminism as always, environmentalism, and uh, I've got some fantastic relationships with writers mm -hmm. uh, uh, like the wonderful Alice Birch or Chris Bush, who I'm, I'm working with and other really exciting writers. So I don't think I think so much of everything being separated into separate categories. Yeah. I just think I've got an idea to explore this and I'm, I've got this fantastic relationship with another artist. So let's explore it together. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't have the wish, like Thomas, to do all my Shakespeare. I've done two Shakespeare's. One, when I was very early on, and I learned that basically he is owned by male directors. Mm -hmm. And there is no point, wait, not for a split second, entering <laughs> the domain of it. It's owned. And it's not just the original material, it's the layers of interpretation and the rules built in, the, the secret rules built into the layers of interpretation. I'm not going there again. I did go there again. Actually, thank heavens with, with lovely Thomas, where I did a show called Ophelia Zimmer, where I cut 98% of Hamlet mm -hmm. and did the play from the point of view of what happened in her bedroom. And I felt much more comfortable. Yeah. And I didn't agree on, and I didn't agree on your reading of the situation of Ophelia. Do you remember we had an argument? A very big argument. Well, that's because you know Shakespeare much better than me. It's like I barely know him at all, and I sort of took all his clothes off. And you're saying, but hang on a moment, he's like a really nice chap, you know. It's like I misunderstood. Yeah, Hamlet, uh, yeah, maybe, yeah, yeah. But it was good that our two shows were on in the same theatre, wasn't it? Try to do a version. Even though it has been done so many times, try to do a version of Hamlet with a female actress as Hamlet. No, because you've got to do the whole of Hamlet then. And all the misogyny built into it. And how do you navigate it? It's just, if you're going to put one's energy anywhere, I think everyone's doing really brilliant work on Shakespeare. <laughs> I don't need to join the party. And it was lovely that my swan song was to do Ophelia's Zimmer to have an argument with you, whilst at the same time you were doing your Hamlet and my Ophelia was also your Ophelia. I mean, how exciting is that as a conversation? Yeah. yeah. You know, I but that's the end of it for me, but but really a thrilling end, your wonderful climax. That is the end of me and Shakespeare. <laughs> no, no, I, I completely understand uh, your point, but um... I just did a version of Twelfth Night, and I think uh, this play is about um, gender politics. Mm -hmm. all it, so. It's hard to navigate the gender politics. They're so toxic. I mean, it, it's just really tricky. And that's just because of the historical period. Um, but, but there we are. OK. <laughs> There we are. Um, <laughs> we're running out of time, but I just wanted to um, say an enormous thank you to both of you for letting us into your arguments, the history of your work together, the history of your oh. clear... You, you know what's, ha what's happening with these Zoom calls as you don't know who's listening and you don't see the people listening. It feels like, oh, we have a nice conversation and you... In the end, you tell much more that you would tell. When <laughs> so it's True. A bit tricky. <laughs> well, where we benefit from that as as people um, listening and watching, and I'm, I mean, in some way, 
I hope you don't feel like it's funny. One of the things that's gone through the whole show is, is costume drama, you taking clothes off. I hope you haven't been made too naked by this whole experience, but um, it's been enormously uh, enlightening and richly clear that actually for both, I don't want to try and bring you into the same space, but for both of you, clearly theatre making is partly about creative relationships, relationships with other individuals, with groups um, and making things happen. Um, and I think that um, that's become, I mean, that's been really, really obvious in, in, in today's discussion. And it's a great privilege and honour to be part of that um, tonight, along with uh, the audience, um, who will also be able to watch this online um, uh, later. We'll, we'll put it online. Um, uh, and I'm also very pleased that this may be the start, as they say in Casablanca, of a beautiful relationship. In other words, that, that we can make more work um, both that the two of you will carry on working, but also that we can we can get involved um, in in various different ways. And when we can start moving around the world again, we'll have to invite you both into a room in Oxford where maybe you can see the people this time as well, and they can actually ask you some questions. That um, would be so nice. Yeah, it would be good. Let's let's do that one day. Um, for now, um, thank you both enormously uh, for for being here tonight, and um, goodbye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All that's left is for me then um, to thank our brilliant speakers, Katie and Thomas, again for a wonderful session. Uh, to thank all you viewers at home for watching and for your comments and questions. Um, and to say that that's the last of the series for this term or for this period. Um, we'll continue again in January as we'll be bring together researchers and students and practitioners from across different disciplines to explore some of the most important subjects, including the ones that we've talked about today, actually, the environment, uh, medical humanities, um, AI and technology and history, as well as celebrating storytelling and performance in its many forms. We hope you'll be able to join us then. And in the meantime, we all hope that you all have a relaxing break over this Christmas and New Year period. Thank you for joining us this evening and goodbye for now.